Well, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Action Black Baptist Ministries. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us this evening, whether you're here in person or listening by Facebook Live. We just uh, really appreciate the Lord will draw you to this time, this appointed place for a time such as this. If you have your Bibles, we're just going to jump right in and turn them to Ephesians chapter 4. We want to look at verses 1 through 6. We won't get to it all tonight, but uh, this will definitely be a three-parter. Mm -hmm. I want to look at point one and two, one for review and two for our application tonight of Bible study. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you so much for this privilege that it is to uh, be able to serve you, to be able to serve you in the body of Christ, to be able to serve with our fellow brothers and sisters, our fellow soldiers, um, those who are on their way to a heavenly place, a place that you have gone away, as you say in John 14, to prepare a place for us where we will come and join you. But until then, we have work to do here on the planet Earth. We have, uh, there are souls that need to be saved, there are disciples that need to be made, there are people who need to be built up in their faith, there are people who need to be helped to be presented to Christ in maturity and full growth. And it is a work that requires labor, it is a work that requires struggling and striving and agonizing. It is a work that can be attacked from the outside and also from the inside of the church. We know we have an adversary who creeps in among us. We know that there are false ideologies, false teachers, false philosophies, false man-made traditions that in our day and age, as they did in biblical times, try to usurp the preeminence and the authority of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that you will remind us of who you have made us to be, and that we will not fall prey to those ideologies, to those philosophies, to those traditions made by man, to the elemental things of this world, to find answers, but that our wisdom will be found in Christ. So prepare our hearts and minds to hear from you. Change us, transform us, exalt yourself this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6 reads as follows. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Paul is speaking here, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling for which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, forbearing with one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. Um, at this time, Timothy is the, probably the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Uh, it would be, behoove you in your spare time to read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy since they are written to the same church as well as, as well as Revelation chapter 2 when Jesus speaks to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. All of those are the same church. So Ephesians is written to the church at Ephesus. 1 and 2 Timothy are written to the church at Ephesus. And Revelation chapter 2, uh, the letter to the church at Ephesus is to the same church. And to get a really good picture of this church, you probably need to read all those letters uh, together, and they will give you a full view. But here tonight, what Paul is wanting to remind them, after having them remind them doctrinally of what God has done, and what the Father has done, and what the Holy Spirit has done in chapter 1, and then talking about the mystery that had been secret or not revealed in the Old Testament, which is the church, and the, the head of the church is Christ, he's also a part of that mystery, his death, burial, and resurrection, but he's talking about that local church, that, that universal church as well, where, where the principles of the universal church in many ways apply to the local church, not in all cases, but in most cases, what we are to be on our way to heaven, and when we get to heaven, we are to be on our way while we're traveling to heaven. We are traveling, we are sojourners, we are pilgrims, we are aliens. Paul talks about that. We are... Um, citizens of heaven, but we also have our citizenship on earth, but your citizenship in heaven is always in Trump, your citizenship on earth. Sometimes I have to hesitate to use that word Trump because it has so many negative uh, 
ideologies in people's minds yeah. that just how bad we are and that's how far off we are from loving and being kind and being gentle. But I use Trump in the sense of its normal usage. It is to usurp your identity, your citizenship in heaven is to usurp your identity and citizenship on earth. Okay. Please forgive me, my voice is going away from me because I've been doing a lot of talking in the last couple hours, and uh, so I'll try to manage as best I can. And so our purpose this evening is to talk about U-N-I-T-Y, unity. Um, I find more and more as I travel, as I minister, as I sit on boards, as I uh, mediate arbitrary situations and issues, there is just the lack of unity among God's people. Uh, I am never surprised by disunity in the culture. I am always surprised by how much disunity there is among God's people. When we supposedly have so much in common. We have the same Lord, as you see. We have the same faith. We have the same baptism by the Spirit into the body of Christ. We have the same indwelling of the Spirit. We have access to the same filling of the Spirit. We have the same God and Father. We have the same Lord Jesus Christ. But somehow, to remind people of those adjectives means nothing when it comes to solving people, person, related problems. And so it is very hard to have unity with the devil if you're a Christian. It is very hard to have unity with the demonic realm if you're a Christian. It is extremely difficult to have unity with polar opposites of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, this is clearly given to us in 2 Corinthians when it talks about what does the law have to do with Christ, what does light have to do with darkness. Mm -hmm. You can't have unity. But yet we try to be a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and wonder why we don't have unity. There is no unity apart from Christ. There is no unity apart from the working of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of individuals and in the group as they connect together as a body. And so it is no secret to me, it may be a secret to others, but it's no secret to me why there is so much disunity in the church. Because we are adding ideologies and philosophies and man-made traditions and I think and our feelings get involved and my experience get involved in this and that and that and this and you can fill in the blank. And it disrupts the, the unity that Christ died to bring about and that the Holy Spirit is supposed to be preserving in and through us as we preserve that same unity among one another. Now unity does not mean sameness. God is not asking us all to be the same. But neither can your difference cause division when the goal and the ideal is unity. So it's not about saying this. We're not all going to think alike. We're all not going to feel alike about the same thing. You love coconut. I throw up on coconut. <laughs> Doesn't mean we can't love one another. Doesn't mean I can't appreciate you eating your coconut and enjoying your coconut from afar. <laughs> Up close when necessary. But I should never let my dislike or your like for coconut cause division between us. Mm -hmm. And it, it is unbelievable to me how many marriages and families and churches and uh, Christians individually and corporately refuse to get along mm -hmm. over things that mean nothing in light of eternity. Right. Right. Uh, you are allowed to have preferences as long as your preferences don't violate the word of God. Amen. But never am I to allow my preferences to cause me to be disunified or divisive with you. Amen. Then I must hold them loosely. Amen. I must be willing to give them up to preserve the unity and love of the brethren and the sister that Christ died and that the Holy Spirit now tries and seeks to maintain. Now, the Holy Spirit has no problem doing his job. But the Holy Spirit is a gentle spirit like a dove. He's not going to make you do anything. 
but he will empower you as you seek to surrender and submit. That is very key to getting the Holy Spirit or inviting the Holy Spirit or allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your life. You must surrender and you must submit. Let me say it one more time. You must surrender. You must wave the white flag. You must put your hands up in the air with no thoughts in your mind, I'm only faking until you get close enough and I can jack you. No, you must honestly surrender. I put my, I'll surrender until I get away from you, and then I'll call some folk and talk about you. That's not surrender. But that's what we think surrender is. And then we don't submit. We don't submit to the Spirit, therefore we can't submit to one another. We can't submit to authority in the home, in the church, on the job, in society under the government that God has placed you under. And that is a very difficult uh, principle to understand how to work out in this democratic society. And also we run many of our organizations like our democracy also. Somebody got to be in charge. Somebody got to make the final decision. Somebody got to say the buck stop here. You can't have I better not say that because that might sound so good. You, you, you can't have the prisoners running the inside. You can't have people who are immature running the inside. You can't have babes running the home. You can't have unspiritual people running the organization in the church. You can never have unity if that is happening. But when everybody thinks their idea holds equal weight, because I'm a man just like you're a man, I'm a woman just like you're a woman, I'm a person just like you're a person. Then everybody thinks their opinion and their feelings and their ideals are right. And so you fight for your point of view, you fight for your point of view, and God says, when are you guys gonna get around to my point of view? <laughs> because there can never be unity till I'm the boss. Till you're thinking my mindset not yours unless, until yours become like God and like Christ. And that's what Paul's saying here. Paul is saying in chapter 1 and 2 and 3, God has done all this stuff for you in saving you and in sanctifying you and choosing you and providing the Holy Spirit to seal you and strengthen you and give you the fruits of the Spirit and give you spiritual gifts that he's going to talk about later in the chapter. Why is there all this disunity? Because there's enemies in the camp. There are people who may be saved, but they're not mature. They're babes, they're carnal, they're fleshly. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 talks about that at the Corinthian church. So Paul is writing to this young pastor, Timothy, and he's challenging the church and the leadership. And he says, and our first point last week was what the priority of the model of unity through the church. The priority of, of the model of unity through the church, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling of which you've been called. Walk like you've been called to walk. And that word call is, as we said last week, a reference to election. You have been elected. You have been chosen. You have been saved by the power of God. You have all blessings located in spirit and heavenly places. You are a part of the mystery that was hidden but now been revealed. You have Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as an example to follow. You have the Holy Spirit sealing you until the day of redemption, chapter 1, verse 14. You have all this. Walk like you've been called. Walk like you were chosen to walk. Now, one of the problems is the church for generations has not done a good job of helping people to understand what this walk is all about. What does it mean to be chosen? What, is, what does it mean to be elected by God? You see, none of us woke up one day and said, you know, I think this is a good day for me to get saved. 
<laughs> you know, I'm a little pitiful sinner. I came on that conclusion on my own. I'm wretched and miserable. I'm separated and, no, God had to turn the light on. You thought you was Mr. Stuff, Mr. Stuff. <laughs> when you was really puffing stuff. You thought you was this and you thought you was that. And, and can I say something to the parents and future parents? Them little demons you trying to raise. They are not little angels. They are not. Look at this little angel. That's a demon. It is. In diapers. Wait. Who, if God doesn't save them, save them, will grow worse and worse in their little demon activities and behavior and attitudes. They're fleshly. They are. They're lost in sin. Shaped in iniquity by their very nature, a child of wrath. Yes. Stop calling them angels. They ain't angels. Mm -hmm. You can call them cute, but they ain't angels. Mm -hmm. And most babies aren't all that cute. Mm -hmm. I just... <laughs> because you're not going to say they're cute when they're running you crazy and you got to go down to the jail cell and get them every week. Or when you got to sit on one side of the glass and they sit on the other side of the glass and you crying and they come out, I was doing my own thing. Yeah, it ain't going to be cute when you get that call, Mr. Man, from your daughter. And she's talking about how this man is treating her and beating her and mistreating her and cheating on her. And it ain't going to be cute then. I know he cute, but he ain't going to be cute when he hitting you upside your head. We need taking all the money and then gone. We're, we're into this cuteness too much. Amen. All the shows on TV are about how people look. Everything in the media and social media is about how people look. Amen. Don't shame me. Then put some clothes on. Don't body shame me. Put some clothes on. We, we've lost any sense of morality in our culture. And the sad news today from this news channel by this reporter, that same shame doesn't even exist in the church in the house of God. Anymore. Therefore, how can we have unity? Well, you can't have unity if you don't first understand you're a prisoner of the Lord. And as a prisoner of the Lord, you are to walk in a way that is worthy of your calling. And when I miss the mark, I confess that I miss the mark and I get back on the right walk. When I stray from the path of this walk, when I'm not looking like what I was called to look like, then I confess it, I turn, and I get back on the path. I don't go over here and have holy votes and separate myself from the people of God. The ones I need to be unified with to be strengthened because they got what I need. Because I'm weak right now. I'm confused right now. I'm upset. I'm hurt. I'm discouraged. I'm depressed right now. That is not the time to separate. That's the time to grow closer and closer and closer. But, you know, God's got a way of keeping you close. Yes. I remember Dr. Tony Evans told, tells this story about when he first met his wife, Lois, who has gone to be with the Lord now, and um, she wasn't really responding to him the way he was wanting her to respond to him. She wasn't really liking him as much as he was liking her. And Tony, being the smart man that he is, decided he needed to create a situation that would draw her closer. So he says they used to go to his amusement park and he, he, understood, he knew that there was in this music park this ride called the Wild Mouse. And so he took her on the Wild Mouse. And long story short, he said, she started out on the other side, but as that ride got to going, she drew closer and closer and closer until you couldn't even tell the two of them apart by the time the ride got done. You can try to stray away from God as you want, but he got a Wild Mouse ride for you. <laughs> that will draw you closer and closer and closer. And, closer. and since I don't like them kind of rides, I decided I just want to stay close so I don't need to get on them rides. 
Stay unified with him. Amen. So he doesn't have to create a situation in your life to draw you back where you should be the whole time. Because he will. Yeah. Some of y'all can be a witness. Yes, sir. That leads us to verse 2 and 3. With all lowliness. So, so there's a certain way we are to be walking based on how we've been called. Everybody with me? Yes. You don't get just to walk any way you want to walk. And call it salvation. Yes, sir. Call it being saved. Now people do that, they just wrong. Amen. Okay? Because Paul's going to give us some descriptions of what this call looks like. Some principles, Amen. I call them. So my second point, after priority of the model of unity to the church, is the principles of the model of unity to the church. And we want to look at verse 2 and 3 tonight for the time we have left. Read with me if you will. He says in verse 1, Walk worthy of the call in which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's what the walk looks like. That's the attitude or principles of the walk. Are y'all with me? Amen. This is what we ought to be walking like if we're going to walk in unity. If we're going to preserve the unity of the spirit because this is what the spirit is going to be producing in our lives as we're growing and maturing and being strengthening and being admonished and being warned and being corrected and being encouraged and being loved and being... That's what it looks like. So there are four principles that I find in this text that I want to pull out tonight. <clears throat> the first one is the principle of lowliness. Lowliness. He says that we are to do what? With all lowliness. Do you walk with lowliness? Do you know what lowliness means? Now, lowliness doesn't mean you a victim. You got to go around acting like you ain't nobody. That's not what lowliness means. Lowliness is another word for humility. Christians are to be humble people. We are to walk this walk with humility. Lowliness is a term not found in Roman or Greek vocabulary because everything was about pride in that culture. This is unique to Christians. And so the Greek word apparently was coined by Christians, perhaps even by Paul himself, to describe a quality for which no other word was available. Humility is the most foundational, listen to me now, humility is the most foundational Christian virtue that you can have. Now, love is the main characteristic that all these other characteristics come out of. Yeah. Amen. But you ought to walk with lowliness, humility. And everything in our culture is about what? Puffing you up. It sure is. Isn't it? Yes. Oh, my child is the best child in the world. Mm -hmm. No, they're not saved. They're a little demon. Mm -hmm. They're unsaved. Mm -hmm. My child is better than your child. Who said? Mm -hmm. And then you put bumper stickers on the back of your car. I'm riding with an A plus two. <laughs> now, there, it's not wrong to be proud of your children. But proud, to be proud of your children and to have pride of your children are two different things. To where you look down on everybody else's children because you think your children are the best. Be proud of your children. You should be proud of your children. I taught my children, and I was proud of them, but I never exalted them to a point where they thought they were better than other people. Always look out for the other person. Always let God raise you up. Don't be raising yourself up. And I will only raise you so far. Up. So be proud of your children. Be proud of their accomplishments. But I'm telling you, it's a thin line between being proud and being proud. We as Christians are to walk with humility. Thinking not more of ourselves than we ought, but not thinking less of ourselves than we ought. That's the balance. 
always wanting the other person to get the appreciation, even at the expense of ourselves. That's what humility is. And Jesus was humble. But Jesus was the God of the universe. Jesus cared about other people. Jesus put other people before himself to the point where he gave his very life for other people. Whether they liked him or didn't like him. Whether they believed in him or didn't believe in him. Jesus gave his life for God so loved the world. John 3, 16, we know it. We just don't live it. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have Everlasting life. God offers salvation to everybody. Jesus says, come unto me, all who are heavy laden and burdened down, and I will give you rest. Rest for your soul. I'm not like the thief who comes to rob, kill, and destroy. I come to give you rest. Even at the expense of my life. I did not come to be served, but I came to serve and give my life as a ransom for me. Humility. See, you can be humble when you know who you really are. <laughs> but if you always got to be exalting yourself, then you cause, that's because you're not so sure about yourself. And there is too much pride in the church and not enough love in it. We can't solve conflict issues because no one's willing to go low so God can go high. No one's willing to be de-exalted so Christ can be exalted. You know, I teach principles on conflict resolution and people just don't listen to me. And the main concept of conflict resolution is how can I exalt God in this situation? You start there. And if you're sitting around the table trying to reconcile people who don't want to exalt God first, shut the book, close the door, and go home. Because you're not going to get anywhere. Because you have learned here at this church, based on what we're going through in Colossians, Christ is to be preeminent in everything. And then we get around the table and it's all about us. It's not about how we can glorify God in this situation. How can, I, how can I make sure God wins even if I got to lose? That's loneliness. That's humility. And that can fix any relationship. If I can get just one person to go low so God can go high, we can work out something. But here's what, what about them? <laughs> When they gonna go low? Why well, always gotta go low? Why well, always gotta be humble? Because you said you wanted to be like Jesus, didn't you? <laughs> Why are you worried about them? You want to be like them, or you want to be like Jesus? Jesus? Now we say that, and please understand me. It's easy to teach this right now, but when you gotta put the rubber to the road, when you gotta live it out, that's when you gotta prove it out. But you got everything you need to be able to live out everything God says the walk contains. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Because I, I can't pull that off of my flesh. Because my flesh is over here yakking at me. <laughs> why, 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 why you got to go low? Yeah. You go low all the time. When they going to go low? They Christians too. <laughs> when, when they going to demonstrate? And there are meetings I've had to have where the whole time in the meeting I'm thinking this and visually I got my foot on my ego under the table. Because I'm an exactly, I'm a competitor. You start yakking at me, I got a couple of notches I can raise my game. When I was set to watch playing basketball, um, that's one of the things God, guys used to tell guys. You get new guys coming in, they think they're the stuff. Because you know, I was a little bit older, I was playing with 20 and 30 year olds. I was in my 40s and 50s, so playing with 20 30 year olds. And then, you know, you, you're an OG. You're an OG. What's up, OG? And they start yakking. 
Come on, OG, what you, what you gonna do, OG? Where your game at? And they was doing, doing. He just out here trying to get some exercise. He ain't trying to prove nothing. And the minute you start yakking, that old athlete comes out. And like Willie Harrison and White Man Can't Jump, I flip that hat around. And it's on. I'll act like I don't know what I'm doing, then I'll flip that hat around. Where'd that come from? I was just out here trying to get some exercise. But you kept yakking. And that old athlete came out. Now, I don't do that anymore because I, I ain't got them levels anymore. So I don't play basketball anymore. Because I ain't got them levels I can go up anymore. This is it. This is it. So I don't, I don't do that anymore. But that, that's, that's what, you got to be low. You got to be humble. But we all have flesh that we got to battle. Some of us got past that come up. And we're tired and we're sick and tired of being walked on and walked over and feel like we're being taken advantage of. You got to stay humble. Mm -hmm. But that's the Holy Spirit's role in your life if you will surrender and submit. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the principle of gentleness. Gentleness. He says, not only are we to walk worthy of the calling for which we're called with lowness, we are to walk with what? Gentleness. Do you know any real gentle people? You know, gentleness is a characteristic we don't see much of. Gentleness. There's, there's another word for this is meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. Meekness is when God can ride you and tell you which way to turn and which way to go, when to stop and when to walk, and when to giddy up. That horse still has all the power it had when it was wild, but is now power under the rider's control. Are you under the spirit's control? And if you are under the spirit's control, not only do you produce lowliness or humility, you produce gentleness and meekness. But that is not weakness. The Bible says Moses was a meek man. Jesus was a meek man, but they were not weak. They were not weak. So don't get it twisted. Meekness, an inevitable product of humility, refers to that which is mild-spirited and self-controlled. Mild-spirited and self-controlled. They never get too high. They never get too low. Some believers I know, they like riding a roller coaster. They <laughs> up, they down. Their highs are highs, and their lows are lows. There's no consistency. <laughs> No. I'm not talking about you. If you're in there, you're in there. You don't like being in there? Get out of there. Amen. <laughs> but it's mildness. It's, 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 it's a mild spirit and self-control. Jesus was like that. Jesus was like that. He was meek. He was mild, but he wasn't weak. And we need more of this in the body of Christ People who are self-controlled. Do you always lose your temper? Do you consistently lose your temper? Do you consistently get depressed? Are your highs real highs and your lows real low? Oh, I know when that sister or that brother is doing well and they love the Lord. Look at them, they all high. Where brother and sister so at this week? They have no low. There's no consistent what? Mild spirit. Because they're not under the self-control of the Holy Spirit. James talks about being able to control your tongue. You can always tell when you got a meek person when they can control that tongue. Because James says you can control that tongue, you can control every other part of your body. Because that tongue is a monster. It starts fire. It has brought down empires. It has raised up people who were nothing to high levels that they couldn't even imagine just because they could use their tongue. They could talk. The Bible says that we 
who are walking worthy of the calling by which we've been called in our daily conduct, ought to be demonstrating what? Meekness. Matthew 5.5, 5, just to give you some scriptures. Matthew 11.9, Galatians 5.23, and Colossians 3.12 all talk about meekness, self-control, mild in spirit. Third principle, the principle of long-suffering. The principle of long-suffering. This is definitely not a characteristic that most people in the church have today. We can't suffer nothing. Ouch. And we're not willing to suffer nothing. Ouch. Amen. Don't even talk about long suffering. I don't even like suffering. <laughs> I don't even want to suck. Let alone long suck. Let alone long suffering. The Greek word literally means long tempered. You don't lose your temper quickly. Some of us got short fuses. Some of us got no fuses. Some of us just dynamite. You don't even need a fuse. But the person who is long suffering has a fuse that never ceases to reach the powder keg. Has a fuse that never seems to reach the powder keg. It refers to resolve, patience. There's an outgrowth of humility and judgment. You see, each one of these builds on each other. Each one of these build on like building blocks, build on like Legos. You can't get anything pictured if you don't have all the blocks. So you need lowliness, humility. You need gentleness, meekness to get to the long side. Without the first two, you, you can't even sniff long suffering. Well, I'm good at loneliness. I just ain't good at long suffering. You ain't good at loneliness there. Well, I'm meek. I just ain't got no patience for people. And you not me. Can't stand people. This world would be so much better if it wasn't for people. <laughs> Hey, hey, don't laugh. Pastors feel that way. Man, if I didn't have to deal with these people, I'd be all right. If you didn't have people, you ain't got no ministry. Amen. Ministry is about people. And they come in all shapes, sizes, colors, and attitudes and behaviors. And it's your job, Mr. Pastor, as we learned last Sunday, to have to what? Labor and agonize so that you may what? To this end, present each one perfect in Christ. Mm -hmm. Welcome to ministry. Mm -hmm. Well, that ain't what they told me in seminary. They lied to you. Amen. They lied to you. Paul says this is what ministry is. You got to labor and agonize with these people. Strive. To this end, to present Colossians chapter 1, we looked at it Sunday, each one what? Mature. People aren't born into the family of God mature. You got to raise them up just like you do babies and youth to teenagers to adults to senior citizens to death. And you have to labor and agonize with that. So pastors definitely got to have these qualities. Mm -hmm. But don't get it twisted as Dr. King would say, y'all got to have it too. Because you got to disciple and minister people within the body of yourself. So you got to be lowly. You got to be gentle. You got to be long suffering. Because ministry is dealing with people. If you see anybody come to church and they cussing out the pew and having a fight with the pew, take them to the hospital or something wrong with them. Because pews can't do nothing. Hello. And if you got no patience with inanimate objects, how are you going to pay you have patience with people? <laughs> Cuss your car out one the side of the street and one the other inside of the street. Computers. Let's say computer. We, the, we as Christians do not demonstrate these characteristics. 
habitually and consistently because none of us do it perfectly. That's why we need repentance because we're going to have to repent sometimes. That's why we need confession because we're going to need to confess sometimes. But it ought to be what? A, his, his, a consistent, habitual walk. Daily conduct. And messing up or missing the mark is to be an exception. But we can flip this thing. Being lowly, being gentle, being loving suffering is the exception. Being cranky, bitter, and anger is the normal rule. And that's the Christian life for most people in their mind. No, 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 it's not. Not according to this text. And this will work even in the ethnic divide that we're having in our country if we were doing this. Amen. This would work in our homes and our families if we were doing this. This would work in our attitude toward the government and the government's attitude toward us if we were doing this. But unfortunately, the church, churches, are messing up the picture. And if you haven't read Revelation chapter 2 to 3, Jesus will hold you accountable for messing up the picture. Mm -hmm. This leads us to the fourth and final principle, the principle of loving forbearance. Remember, each one of these build on one another. You can't have one without the other. You need all four principles to be working in your life. And the Holy Spirit is the one who enables these principles to work in your life, but it won't enable you if you are not willing to surrender and submit. Okay. Look at verse 2. And three. Long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Now, how, how are we to bear with one another? Amen. Why you got your face twisted like that? Talking about you put that with <laughs> Why, 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 why are you, why are you, why are you slapping yourself in your face trying to put up with folks? Reminds me of a story. There was, there, was a, there was a guy who was a, a preacher who was at the grocery store, and he saw this lady and, and, and a little girl, and, and the mother was saying, Jane, straighten up. Jane, don't lose your temper. Jane, don't raise your hand like that to hit, hit someone. Jane, control yourself. Jane, get yourself under control. And the preacher went to the lady and says, are you having problems with little Jane? Her name is Aubrey. My name is Jamie. <laughs> She's talking to herself. <laughs> but I'm putting up with it. No, no, no. That's not loving forbearance. Bearing with one another in love. Humility and gentleness and patience are reflected in a forbearing love for others that is continuous and unconditional. No strings attached. If you would act right, then I would love you better. That's not for bad. It's, it's unconditional. It's continuous and unconditional. See, see, brothers and sisters, I, I, I've kind of figured out the Christian life based on biblical principles. You know, really all it takes is just treat people the way you want God to treat you. Just treat people the way you want God to treat you. If you, if when you mess up, you want to be able to go to God and say, God, forgive me and confess it and have him restore you with no attitude, not did this, not block you on the heavenly phone so that he don't take your calls anymore. Do that to others. Yeah, I forgive you, but you block me. Michael, Gabriel, block their number on the line. Don't, don't, let them, don't let no calls come from them on the heavy line. But with me and me, you all right. We, I'm all right with them. We, we good. They never just block. We, we don't want God to do that to us, do we? No. You don't want your heavenly Father, your Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit to do that to you? Then if you don't want God to treat you like that, don't treat your brother and sister like that. <laughs> no. 
God, me and you cool. I just ain't going to church no more. Okay. I ain't going to worship you. I know church is all about you and it ain't about me, but there's some people there I got a problem with right now. You don't want God to do that to you, do you? No. I will not come and visit your house anymore. I will not send any angels to your house to cover you, to protect you. I will not come and have fellowship with you anymore because there's some people in your house and you the main one I got a problem with. So no matter how much you invite me to come into your presence, you don't want God to treat you like that, do you? Then why would you treat other people like that? See, it's, it's the old rule. Do unto others as you would have. But see, we forget how we mistreated other folks when other people mistreat us. See, old folk aren't the only ones to get Alzheimer's. We get Alzheimer's too. When it comes to the sin that we have committed against others and against God. And then we all upset about the sin that somebody has done to us. Paul says that's not the walk you were called to walk. That's not a walk that's worthy of the calling which God called you to. And this would solve all of the racial issues, ethnic issues, cultural issues, church issues, home issues, husband and wife issues, parent and child issues, if people were really walking in this unity. Yes. Amen. In other words, be Christian. Outside of Sunday morning. Yeah, and maybe Wednesday night. He says, and we're going to pick up here in verse 3, every endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's, that's what we're shooting for. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because it's the Spirit that's supposed to what? Be empowering all this stuff. It's the Spirit that empowers you and empowers you and empowers you and empowers you and, and empowers us and we link up together. Yeah. We making the spirit look bad. Oh. Hmm. We're making the Holy Spirit look like he can't do nothing with us. And, and that is amazing to me. And, and it's, it's the context of sanctification. That's what Paul's really talking about here. Because if he did all this stuff in chapter 1, 2, and 3, why he got such a problem in chapter 4, 5, and 6? See, people believe they were placed in the body by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. He can do that. We believe that the Holy Spirit birthed us, the new birth, John chapter 3. You must be born again by the Spirit. We believe the Holy Spirit can raise us up from the dead and place us into Christ's death, birth, and resurrection. He just can't make us be lonely, patient, meek, <laughs> with loving forbearance. All this mess that's going on in God's house don't make no sense. It just doesn't make any sense. Unless we got people who are not Christian, who are babes, and don't know better, and got to be taught better, and got to be disciplined until they grow into what? Maturity. Or their young, rebellious youth who want to live their own lives under your house in a guy's house. Or they're carnal. They're Christians, but they're carnal. They're fleshly, and they live by their flesh. They don't live by the Spirit. That's only four reasons you can have all this mess. Because mature people don't produce that stuff. They produce this. This is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1, 2, 2. But everybody thinks they mature because they're Christians. Now let's see how you act when the rubber meets the road. When you're rubbed the wrong way. When other people are trying to exalt themselves over you and you know, you feel in your flesh that they shouldn't be able to do that because you're just as good as they are. Can you go low then? Can you be humble then? But people will just run you over. At least they ain't killed you like they did Jesus yet. They killed Jesus. He was humble and they killed him. He was meek and they killed him. He was long-suffering and they killed him. 
He brought nothing but loving forbearance and they killed him. You just got people who ain't treating you right. <laughs> but by Pastor Clay, come to the real world. That, that, that's, just, that's good Bible, but that's not real life. Why is Paul telling them to walk worthy of the calling which they will walk? And he's talking to people who live in life on earth. We have got to start asking ourselves some serious questions. Amen. We have got to start doing some serious evaluation. When we don't look like what the Bible says on a consistent, habitual basis and are not willing to humble ourselves and repent with meekness and long-suffering and loving forbearance, you have got to ask yourself some questions. And pastor have got to stop letting people act a fool in God's house. Because you're going to be held accountable. And this doesn't only go for God's house. This goes for your house yes, when you get home. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, you can't stay in my house and act a fool. Because it's not my house. That's God's house. I'm just a renter. I'm a steward. He's the owner. I got to run the house according to his ownership name. No I mean I don't love you, I just don't love you as much as I love the owner. And I, I want the owner's blessing, I want the owner's favor. I can't love you so much that I disappoint the owner. And that's hard decisions sometimes, brothers and sisters. And they'll call you everything but a child of God. That's because they're not lowly. That's because they're not meek. That's because they're not long-suffering. And they have no loving forbearance. That's why they're not walking worthy of the calling by which they were called. They don't have it in them. They don't have it in them. So why are you trying to please the devil's kids? Father, we just thank you for this time in your word, in your word in us. Before we start examining other people, may we allow the word to look at ourselves. How am I doing with humility, loneliness? How am I doing with meekness? How am I doing with long suffering? How am I doing with loving forbearance? for others, who offend me, who hurt me, who bring pain and sorrow in my life? Am I trusting in the one who is calling me so that I'm willing to surrender and submit to him? Not my feelings, not my emotions, not my circumstance, not my situation. Because it's all about your glory and not about mine. Father, we all need help. We are still growing, maturing in this area. But we must stop acting like we don't know what the truth is. And strive to live in line with the truth. Labor, not by our strength, but as we learn in Colossians, by the power that works mightily in all of us. Just like it worked in Paul, just like it worked in Peter, just like it worked in Christ, just like it has worked in you. And as you do this, Father, may unity be very visible to a lost and dying world who needs to be drawn out of darkness into the light. May it be evident between for those who are struggling for examples who demonstrate that the Christian life is real and that it can be lived, no matter what their struggles or experience in the past have been. Strengthen us, strengthen this church, strengthen other churches, so that we may become a testimony of the light and not a testimony of the darkness. Father, have your way. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray.